Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again. And Neil Almond. Good to be back. Now, before we get started, we have a few items to attend to. Um, and first up, it's time for our new segment, I'm Not Crying, a short salute to our listeners, where we share some of the lovely things members of the Tadabe family have had to say about the podcast. This one comes from Torch, S-C-I-T-T, um, and it says, Trainees, this is the best year for education. So many great discussions at your fingertips to tap into. It can be hard to navigate as a beginning teacher. This is very accessible and highly recommended, thinking deeply about primary education. So big thank you to Torch CITT for the review on Listen Notes. I think it was left a while ago, but it was only recently seen by me, who is a, a dinosaur. Um, and if you want to help spread the word about the podcast or just share some of the ways listening has helped you, please do leave a review wherever you listen. And also going to mention on December 30th, like we mentioned on the 100th episode, we have a 12-hour live stream in aid of Valindra. From 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Obviously, Chris, we've got your session between 12 and 1 p.m. where we're going to look at the art and science of primary reading. You know, mistakes were made, hashtag 2.0. Um, and then, Neil, you're also going to do your session on comprehension. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that. And over the next while, we're going to release uh, all, the, all the hours. Hopefully, it should be a really good day. Now that's taken care of, the focus of this week's episode is going to be the Great Subject Knowledge Compendium Part 2. Last year, around about this time, Neil, Chris, we went through all of the places that we can go to to improve our own subject knowledge. And the intention is that this time round, it's almost a top-up because we don't really want to go over old ground too much. But there may have been things that we've come across in the last 12 months that we think Oh, yeah, that'd be really useful for teachers to know about. And so last time we started with reading. And I think that makes sense again, because I'm here with both of you. Um, and we explored Being Brave, which is Simon Smith's blog, The Art and Science of Teaching Primary Reading by Christopher Such. Very short introductions um, to English literature. And Carl Duke's curriculum book list. Is there anything we can add to reading at the end of 2022? Yep, quite a few things that we can add here. I'll start with a book, or it's actually a pair of books by Aidan Chambers. One's called Tell Me, one's called The Reading Environment. The titles are actually slightly longer than that. There are little subtitles to them, but that's how it's commonly known. They are books that are full of wisdom, I would say, and lots of practical advice in inspiring young readers but not just inspiring young readers but actually inspiring people in the teaching of their reading so yeah I definitely check out those two I would also check out uh, guided reading layers of meaning by Tennant Reedy, Hobsbawm and Gamble lots of really wonderful snippets of discussion that are in that book if you want to develop your questioning your interaction with pupils to show how you can find that middle ground between um, just ex just explicitly telling and explaining something and doing a game of guess what's in my head with students, then those the little scripts, the little lesson plan parts that are in there are really uh, valuable. More directly, I guess, on the subject knowledge thing, and I wouldn't have said this a while ago, but I've been converted somewhat to the teaching of aspects of Shakespeare by Zoe Enser, in particular, her book, bringing forth the bard which is as well as being beautifully written really accessible really does have something for the primary school teacher even if you get to the end of the book and think no actually this isn't an area that I think is right for my school um I do think that you might you'll still find something of value in it I guess in terms of you know subject knowledge what it takes to teach reading I'm almost surprised that we didn't mention Ending the Reading Wars last time, the classic, it's already a classic paper by Castles, Russell and Nation. And one more thing, if you're looking for something kind of quite short, 
quite pithy. And if you're looking for someone to arrogantly recommend something of their own, then I'm going to recommend what's stopping us from teaching reading comprehension really well, which is a blog that I wrote um, about six months ago that kind of sums up my thoughts on this subject. And I think should help teachers to go in a slightly better direction with their teaching of reading comprehension if they are a little bit demotivated if they feel like they're not exploring books in an authentic way so yeah quite a lot on reading I can't promise I'll have quite so many ideas with everything else so almost <clears throat> like clockwork really given that um Simon we mentioned Simon Smith and Carl Duke at the the introduction there just Today or this week, um, Carl Duke has updated that list of uh, children's literature. That's why um, that's certainly what Carl Duke and uh, Simon Smith <clears throat> excel at, as well as being you know, more than competent leaders at schools. Um, their subject knowledge of children's literature is uh, you know, second to none. So I can really recommend Carl Duke's updated list, as well as uh, Simon Smith has done a, uh, for the last 40 days, I think he's done uh, a, a Twitter thread of his top picture books of 2022, and you know who doesn't love uh, you know a good picture book at, at primary? So those two are very good, up to date, recent resources, particularly for um, knowledge of reading in terms of children's literature. I then kind of have three uh, ideas for subject knowledge themselves. Um, I won't leave um, Chris's my recommendation of Chris's uh, till the end. I'll get that out of the way right now. So Chris, I don't know when it was. Um, Assuming between last year and this year, um, recorded perhaps a, a five, seven minute video on phonics and what phonics actually is and means. And the purpose of it was to uh, show secondary school teachers, I believe that was their target audience, what um, that was for. And so it's a really nice and concise uh I don't want to use the word deep dive on an educational podcast, but that's what it was, deep dive on uh what phonics actually is. Uh, along with that, then I have two um, Reading League episodes, which are a uh, an American podcast, but they put them up on YouTube as well. Um, the two I particularly recommend are the one with uh, Tim Shanahan, who is always um, incredible at kind of looking at the research and actually doing, looking at what research actually tells you to do and not, um, you know, things that you might then extrapolate from that research. Um, so he's always a good one to listen to. Don't always agree with what he says, um, but 90% of what I uh, listen to him say, I, I nod my head and go, yep. Um, and the other one then is uh, Liana Aries uh, one because she goes through orthographic mapping, uh, which is such an important process in children actually learning how to read as well. Um, so if you took note of uh, last year's and you read Chris's book and you, you would have come across that term orthographic map mapping and you want to go into a little bit more detail then uh Linnea Airy talks about that for about a good hour on there so definitely worth a watch I have absolutely nothing to add to reading and um, largely because I know you guys are going to bring loads to the table in that field uh, so I can focus my energy on there uh, on other areas that might perhaps like we said be less well served further down the down the line so what about mathematics? I mean, last time, I mean, obviously, quite naturally, we had loads. We had 100 Ideas by Shannon, Mastery in Primary Mathematics by Tom Gary, Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics, another very short introduction, this time to mathematics, the NCTM example lesson videos, the early childhood maths group, um, and then some curriculum tools. Is there anything else you guys would add? Neil, what would you add this time round? So I've only got two, and I think I'm right in this, but since we recorded the first one, um, Complete Maths, so again, not sponsoring, and obviously the host uh, works for them, um, but you know, uh, they made a lot of their material free as well, I think. Since then, all you have to do is sign up with an email, um, and you, can, you get access to all of um, the tutor videos, and you get access. You get access to the tutor side of that. So although your pupils don't um, 
benefit from tutor you as the teacher can go and watch any granule that um, complete maths have in their maths curriculum and you can watch how that's taught uh, which for an ECT is obviously uh, invaluable um, as well as the classroom element of it which has their whole curriculum where you can go and have a look and there's uh, a wealth of pedagogical notes and misconceptions and all these ideas that um, help you teach that uh, granule as they're known as in a complete math so definitely if you don't have a um uh, an account and you want to look at that i fully recommend that and then linked to that as well is um they recently produced a uh, a podcast called uh, teaching together where they take one of those granules and they just talk in depth for a nice you know it's 20 25 minutes real uh easy listen uh, where they take one of those objectives and just talk about how they how they teach that and then they produce um some resources to help you do that in the classroom as well so um let's say it's called complete math so it spans from all the way from nursery all the way up to i think 18 if not more so every depending on the phase that you teach you may not be listening in every week but um so far the the ratio of uh what would be classified as you know primary content and secondary content has been pretty uh pretty balanced so always one to check out all the way from birth nail from zero 18 and beyond you know i'm not really 100 percent convinced i know what age it finishes at but i know that it gets pretty advanced towards the uh sort of the upper remit of uh thing you've stolen one of mine neil you know i love the fact that dave has his resources um and the accompanying slides you know for the teach do practice behave uh, sort of episode that Mark outlines in Teaching for Mastery. And I think once he's recorded all 1800 plus episodes, you know, you've got a really good uh, sort of place for people to go, you know. And Surely that's the uh, time to then, uh, you know, consider looking at the curriculum and thinking about what needs to change. So, you know, he then has a, a few more that he needs to then, uh, yeah. an ever growing cycle of uh, curriculum development and podcast being recorded. I told him he's got a job for life there. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like a decent time for me to jump in with a few the first one i'm going to say i can't remember whether this was mentioned last year and i don't care I'm, if if we do this every year from now until like we're all old men i will mention this website every single time it comes around the learning trajectories website is gold dust for the development of your subject knowledge as a math teacher particularly as i say for early mathematics it is yeah, it's wonderful. You set up, you give yourself a dummy class and you can see what uh, the development of various areas of mathematics look like. There are little videos. Um, it's, yeah, it's a superb resource that ties in beautifully with the work of uh, Douglas Clements and Julia Sarama, and na names that you'll be familiar with, certainly if you are fans of the podcast. One of my favourite books that I've read, I've read this year, I I got completely by accident. I was kindly sent this book by um, a chap called Danny Yee on Twitter. And the book is called Arithmetic by Paul Lockhart. And it looks at the, the basis of arithmetic. It explains it in the most simple terms, almost as if we are discovering the basis of arithmetic together, not just arithmetic in the familiar base 10 with place value that we use most commonly now, commonly now, but also different ways of thinking about arithmetic. And it changed how I think about the manipulation of number. It changed how I explain the manipulation of number, which I've noted because I've been tutoring a friend's son recently. And I found the explanation of place value and base 10 so much more intuitive after having read this book. So I'd highly recommend it. It's also just a great read. I also went back to a bit of a classic, Thinking Mathematically by John Mason. I think that it's, there are two other authors involved with this book, but it says John Mason and then with. So I'm sure they made a vital contribution, but I'm sure they'll forgive me for not including, including or remembering their names in this case. But Thinking Mathematically, if you're interested in exploring mathematics a bit further what it what it can be the extent to which it's can be thought of as a creative um subject full of exploration then that's somewhere to go i have also gone back to possibly one of the first books i read when it comes to subject knowledge with math uh, when it comes with mathematics which is understanding mathematics for young children uh by derek haylock and Anne coburn which is there's a lot of overlap in the content um, within that as there um, with the uh, other book 
by Derek Haylock, which covers the rest of um, primary mathematics. But this one targets um, early mathematics a little bit more. I think it's a little light on certain subjects like supertizing, but it's a really terrific and accessible read and a really good place to go. Just before you go in, Kieran, I've recently been getting through uh, Paul Lockhart's Geometry as well, um, which same premise as uh, arithmetic, but in the looking at geometry as well. And it's, yeah, fascinating, interesting, um, and I think really well written for a layman like me to kind of really appreciate the subtleties of geometry that it's certainly when you think about maths is not my particular strong point. So throw that one out there as well. Thank you for reminding me of that one, Chris. One last book. I'm not sure Kieran will forgive me for saying it, but I gave uh, Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics a third read a couple of months ago. And it's one of these books that it, I won't say it gets better with every read. <laughs> it's so good on the first read that it's hard for it to get better. But you see different things within it. You understand a bit more because you come back to it with a greater appreciation of mathematics from the first read. So if you're after a maths book that you can go back to time and again, then I definitely recommend checking out uh, Tadapum, as I guess we would call it. Oh, that's that's totally unexpected and uh, unnecessary, but appreciate that, Chris. Are you going back to looking for punctuation errors and <laughs> when you're in your free time? <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. I, I wasn't interested in the content. I was I was looking to find you know misplaced commas, etc. But I got sucked in by the um, the charm and the <laughs> content. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, we yeah, I only I missed out a row earlier on because yeah, obviously, Chris, you you recommended CGP revision guides and mathematics explained for teachers, which is Haylock and Manning. Um, and then I had a few by Marcus de Sotoy as well. Um, and so I had Marcus de Sotoy blog post of his. And it's about I think I pronounced, pronounced this right. The Messiah Quartet for the End of Time. And essentially, it's about the mathematics within that. And so I've got a link to a tweet where he talks a bit more about it and then a blog and essentially looking at the golden ratio within within uh, this this quartet um, for the end of time. And yeah, well, well, we're checking out. Obviously, teaching together. There's a there's a podcast that I that I find really interesting. It's called Progressively Incorrect with uh, is it Zach Groschel um, and he in season two, episode four, he has Sarah Powell on, and they talk about pervasive myths in mathematics education. And you know, I really like the uh, the sort of way that they approach, you know, ed education. And I think there's a lot of value in listening to that podcast. Tom Brassington came up with another ATM book, Thinking for Ourselves. You know, a book by the Association of Teachers of Mathematics, um, and he says it's really good for reasoning stuff and lisa co says that she uses maths for kids um on youtube quite a lot and she sends her teachers in that direction so i think there's there's definitely lots for mathematics have any of you guys listened to progressively incorrect not one i've come across but now that you've thrown it back out to us i've got a couple more things i want <laughs> to mention because they just jumped to mind um earlier in the year i listened to a um a, a youtube video uh, called An Introduction to the Philosophy of Mathematics by, I think it's Ray Monk. And that is wonderful. I've listened to it now five or six times, and I think I'm nearly beginning to understand it, um, or at least parts of it. It's really terrific. But I, the one that the reason I've jumped back in here in particular, about two and a half, maybe three years ago, a website, I was recommended a website um, called structuringinquiry.com which is offers free professional development in in mathematics it's, it's a course it takes i think there's 30 hours worth of learning within it i've done probably about 10 hours in it and it's not bits and pieces it has this flow and structure to it it introduces um it was my first experience of variation theory i think or certainly how it can be applied in practice so if you're just looking for something that you can log into, you can work through progressively and come away from it thinking different differently about how to teach, how to plan mathematics, I'd highly recommend structuringinquiry.com. I'll complete the uh, the trio of the complete maths offer then, and I'll say CPD College as well. 
you know, there are videos by yourself there, Kieran. So, you know, full disclosure in that one. But a lot of it is just uh, plenty by Johnny Hall, particular. Any course that he's done, I always find particularly interesting, really good for that pedagogical content knowledge. So on teaching fractions, I have these weird things that someone said they're called Cuisinerods. How the hell am I meant to use these to teach fractions to kids? You know, Johnny's got a couple of hours worth just kind of going through the, the basics and beyond on there. It's one of the courses, um, I think he did that live during a, uh, a, during one of the first lockdowns. I think Chris and I went on it and we came back and talked about it afterwards and gone, yeah, they're pretty cool, aren't they? You can do quite a fair bit with those quiz and their rods. They're probably worth uh, investing a bit of time in. But he covers plenty of uh, manipulatives that um, are probably sitting around in cupboards now. So now that COVID is kind of over, we can kind of get all that stuff out again. A real good uh, refresher for many teachers as to how to use these uh, appropriately. So I'll finish that one off. You said to me a while ago that uh, you wanted a session about teach through practice behavior, but with but being primary specific. And so I went to the college and I looked at Gary Lamb's courses on teach through practice behavior, and I thought I'm going to have to think really diff or you know I'm going to think a lot about how I can improve on Gary's session because actually I think it's both primary and secondary specific. You know, it's maths education specific, and so I I, I changed my title my session because I couldn't beat it in time for the next maths comp online. Not beat it, but I couldn't <laughs> rise to the, the quality necessary to compete or um, sort of exist in the same realm as, the, as that CPD. So, yeah. yeah. Um, the two that he has on, I think it's fractionness and equality are, um, yeah, well worth everyone's time just looking at how that idea, how those ideas kind of develop. And as you say, those two do span primary and secondary, but I think there's definitely scope for yeah, some primary specific ones and what it looks like in the primary classroom which it will undoubtedly look different to in the secondary classroom just for the fact that you know, we have them there all the time and we're going to see them day in day out and all of that minutiae of differences so yeah looking forward to that one from maths conf and maybe we should say you know maths comps are pretty good for subject knowledge as well so come along to some of those yeah next one online is the 23rd of january and so tickets are available now. I mean, I don't mind. Um, I, and certainly I think anyone who's listened the whole way since 2021 will know that we've been recommending this stuff long before um, it became, I don't know, what's the what's the word? Um, you know, no one's asked me to promote the, the company on the podcast. This is stuff I was doing anyway. I was a member of the CPD college for like two years. I think I'm pretty sure in thinking deeply about primary mathematics, I mentioned the complete mathematics curriculum as an example of a high quality curriculum that you would sort of utilize and um, to support your teachers in their professional development. You know, so I have, uh, you know, I have no issue with this. It. Not as if, you know, Pepsi have come and said, can you tell us about how much you enjoy Pepsi? And um, that, that would be a totally different situation. Like the, like the, the current courting of audible, you know, hopefully one day one of them will stumble across it. <laughs> It's not mathematics, but if you want to improve your subject knowledge on advertising, I fully recommend the uh, Pepsi documentary on Netflix. <laughs> it is quite something. What a coincidence. <laughs> the reason that ending the reading wars and learning trajectories aren't on here is because I think there was a point in the first 52 episodes where we were recommending at least one of them on a weekly basis. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we... We decided we wouldn't go over um, all ground, but definitely, I think, you know, especially if anyone, this is the first time they come to the podcast, well, we're checking out because those are, those are cornerstones of our thinking in a lot of, lot of ways. What about grammar? In a few cases, you'll have noticed that these are books or resources that I've mentioned previously, either as, you know, what you're reading for or just things that have come up in conversation. Uh, and this is another example of that. Lynn Stone's Language for Life is a really accessible introduction to kind of like linguistics for teachers. And um, as a big part of that, it's talking about um, grammatical structures within language and how they can be taught to children. Really fascinating book, even if you don't use, you know, the sequences of teaching that are within it, just as a resource to develop your subject knowledge in this area, really well worth checking out. 
I'm going to uh, petition that we kind of can throw in pun spelling, punctuation uh, with grammar as, you know, keep those things uh, coherent and indeed uh, a bit of writing as well. So I have two for these. Um, one is um, it's called the Dictionary of the British English Spelling System by uh, Greg Brooks. It's a, an open book, so he's um, written it. Um, he works, I believe, at the University of Sheffield, and um, I've definitely recommended a few of his uh, papers before. He was the one who um, tried to understand the history of SAPPIN and why it is that most uh, phonic schemes uh, usually start with the phonemes uh, SAT. <laughs> So he's compiled this book. Um, it's free if you Google it. Um, Greg Brooks Dictionary, the British English Spelling System. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, it is a really thorough, in-depth spelling dictionary, which is always going to be useful. It gives you little nice bits of history, bits of etymology, bits of morphology. Um, it's over 300 pages, and he's put it out there for free. So I think that's a, a really fantastic resource there for teachers to use. Um, the other one, um, <clears throat> something I've kind of been dipping in and out for a while now, but I, uh, full disclosure, I haven't finished it, but I'm really enjoying um, what I have read of it. And it's a book called um, Do I Make Myself Clear by Harold Evans. And the subtitle is Why Writing Well Matters. Uh, I like it particularly because in the introduction, uh, he mentions the, the film The Big Short and how people who um, signed those agreements for subprime mortgages didn't really understand what they were reading. And equally, the people who wrote all those contracts about subprime mortgages didn't really understand the words that they were putting down into uh the written form and how then obviously the economy at 2007 2008 um you know took a steep nosedive but it's a, the book really interesting just how we learn to write well um very similar to um i forget the name of the author but i'm sure someone here will help me out um uh writing in a few short or writing well in a few short sentences by i want to say vera someone but i might be wrong on that but i'm sure chris can come and uh save me here is that several short sentences about writing that's the uh, one yeah. several short sentences about writing very similar that ilk a little bit more in depth i don't know if we recommended that last time but if not definitely should as well because i, know, I think chris you said like the last 20 percent was some of the best writing cpd you ever did about why it really unpicked why some writing was good and equally why some writing was was terrible so it's a brilliant uh, demonstration of the value of examples and non-examples because the first 80 percent of the book is so beautifully written it's this beautiful example and then he chooses a load of non-examples and these are brief these are sentences or short paragraphs by people who he worked with who he said these people went on to be brilliant writers you know in many cases but these are not their strongest bits of work and he just picks apart and say well this why does this not hit home why does this not make sense so yeah Verlin Klinkenborg's several short sentences about writing is a masterpiece on that subject i'd say how could you not remember klinkenborg neil <laughs> come on <laughs> it is a great name it is a great name just if we're going into kind of writing bits is that possible like so i would add there i, I saw it again the other day i watched it years ago i think it was one of the very first things i ever saw on youtube i've got a feeling and um, there's a there's lots of lectures by kurt vonnegut on YouTube, and they're all fantastic to my mind because I, I I like the way he speaks and I like the way he writes. Um, his lectures on story shape, I think, are a fascinating way to think about narrative structure, uh, and and well worth considering. Well worth kind of seven or eight minutes of your time. And maybe I'm just going to stretch this a little because obviously it links to writing and it links to grammar and kind of reading what you've talked about before but I've spent the a little while learning a little bit more about oracy um over the past few months obviously as a as part of um helping to co-write bits and pieces relating to the MPQLL I'd recommend a, a book called Classroom Talk by Rupert Knight which is a really skinny kind of 80 to 100 pages or so that goes into the research into oracy really great little book and if you work with younger children, particularly kind of reception, or if you happen to work in other aspects of EYFS, a book that I recommended recently, How Children Learn Language by, uh, I think it's William O'Grady. I'm not sure about the first name, but certainly O'Grady is, um, yeah, such a light 
engaging read full of cool little anecdotes about and examples of how young people's language accelerates so rapidly and so fascinatingly. Nice. Last time we looked at Filer's modern English usage, right word at the right time, English for everyone, visual guide to grammar and punctuation. Those two are from DK, I think. A grammar book by Zoe and Timothy Paramore, Elements of Style, also a staple of early episodes, Grammar Snacks by the British Council, and then Myths, Lies and Half-Truths of Language Uses. Um, I've got two to add. Um, it's a book that I've seen Adam Smith recommend, and I've seen Peps recommend it as well. It's called Write Useful Books by Rob Fitzpatrick. And essentially, I think it's got a focus on writing useful nonfiction, and there might also be lessons for the messages that we're giving children when they're learning to read. Maybe not word for word, but there are definitely some uh, some themes. And the second one is from Purpura in 2012, and they were looking at a model of language knowledge, and they've got a taxonomy of language knowledge within that, and so I'm going to make that link available with this episode. So I think we're probably about halfway through. So I think if we put a pin in it there and we'll come back and we'll look at the rest of the subjects next time. So all I said to do is say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. And to everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.